Lake Champlain Sea Grant and all of our partners um, from around the basin. So just as a reminder, we'll be doing these every Tuesday and Thursday, hopefully for the rest of the school year. We already have a bunch planned, so thanks for joining us. A little bit of background on Lake Champlain Sea Grant. So we develop and share uh, science information from around the Lake Champlain Basin to benefit the people and the economies and the communities uh, that we all love and call home. So the Watershed Alliance is the education arm of Lake Champlain Sea Grant that's made up of myself and Caroline, who was just speaking, and Ashley Eaton, who is also on the line with us today. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And so for today's uh, jump off, our first Zoom a Scientist session, we have Eric Howe, who will be our main presenter today from the Basin Program. Uh, we also have a number of Lake Champlain Basin Program staff joining us who will be helping to field some of your questions in the question and answer box. Folks like Steph Larkin and Colleen Hickey, uh, who are both on the line so far. So a little bit about Eric Howe. Eric became the director of the Lake Champlain Basin Program and Champlain Valley National Heritage Partnership in 2016. Eric first joined the Lake Champlain Basin Program in 2009, managing water research projects and meeting with scientists from New York, Quebec, and Vermont. He received advanced degrees in natural resources, wildlife and fisheries biology from the University of Vermont. Before that, Eric studied ecology at SUNY ESF and Paul Smith's College in New York. He loves science and has focused a lot of energy in fish biology, including lamprey, shoreline habitat, and all things water. Eric lives in Williston, Vermont with his wife, two children, and a dog, where he is an avid gardener and explores the art of freestyle cooking. Super fun. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn it over to Eric Howe, and he'll begin sharing his screen and has a lovely presentation for you all today. Uh, about Basin Basics. So welcome, Eric, and thank you. All right. Thanks, Nate. <clears throat> um, hopefully you all can see my screen now. Yeah. It's not that strong, um, so I think it's more important for, for you all to hear me rather than see me. Um, so I'm turning this off. There we go. Uh, so hopefully you all will be able to hear me okay. Um, so uh, thanks, Nate, for that nice introduction. Um, a little bit about the Lake Champlain Basin Program. We uh, work very closely with many watershed partners um, like Lake Champlain Sea Grant and also federal agencies uh, like the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and a, a bunch of other groups, um, as well as state, state and local agencies, and uh, folks north of the border in Quebec, uh, Ministry, of, Ministry of Environment, and other uh, similar agencies to coordinate management of the Lake Champlain watershed or the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, <clears throat> so for today, uh, Um, so I'm just going to get right into it here. Um, so for today's outline, I'm going to re review a few Lake Champlain Basin facts, uh, the state of Lake Champlain with regards to phosphorus issues, and then aquatic, aquatic invasive species issues. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, swimming and fishing in Lake Champlain, and then we'll have an opportunity for any final questions. And I think we'll have, uh, we have some polling questions that are kind of built into the presentation here um, that you all can answer through, uh, through the polling feature of the Zoom. And then also I think a few chat box questions as well that you can answer uh, right in the chat window that you were all typing into when you introduced yourselves earlier. So I guess we're gonna start off with a quick poll question. Um, <clears throat> oops, I wanna get back out of here. Um, so what is a basin or a watershed? Uh, 
So I am, so this is Ashley and I'm moderating the polls for today. And so you should all see this pop up as another little box on your Zoom screen. It looks like we've got votes rolling in and you should be able to click um, on an answer for this question. If you're having a problem, go ahead and pop that note in the chat box and I can help you out. So Ashley, how long are we keeping this particular poll open? So Go we ahead. have, let's probably another 15 to 20 seconds. Looks like we've got 50% of folks have answered. Okay. Nobody thinks it's a giant sink with yellow rubber duckies. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. Here we go. All right, so 91% of, of you uh, participating uh, answered that all of the land area that drains toward a body of water is the lake basin, which is correct. Um, that out. Presentation, okay. Working through this fancy te fancy technology here. So yeah, so a, a, um, a lake basin or a watershed is, is that is the correct answer. All of the land area that drains toward a body of water. So for lake. Um, as far east as uh, Dallas and Greensboro in, in Vermont, um, in the Memorial Watershed. Uh, Memorial River watershed and the, the Winooski watershed is just south of there. And as far as south as uh, Lake George in New York, uh, westward is Lake Placid and, and a little bit beyond that in the Saranac Lake region of New York. And all the way up into Quebec. I mentioned earlier that we work with Quebec partners and this is why. About 7% of the Lake Champlain Basin is located north of the border in Quebec. Um, in the Missisque, what we call the Missisque um, subwatershed or subbasin, the, that land area drains to Missisque Bay up in the northern part of the lake. Um, so overall, the Lake Champlain Basin is 8,234 square miles. So I expect we'll be updating that number. Um, in the, in the coming year after the current census is complete. Um, you can find out a lot more information about the Lake Champlain Basin um, on this website that we have down here, the atlas, A-T-L-A-S dot L-C-D-P dot org. Um, you, can find, this is, you can find lots of different maps and, and, and uh, a lot of other information on, on, the, on the Lake Champlain at that resource. Um, so moving on to the next slide, what is your basin? I heard, I was trying to keep track of uh, folks who were, who were checking in um, on, as they were registering a little while ago, and we had a pretty good spread for folks from around the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, so for those of you that live in, within uh, the Vermont or New York areas, um, you should think about, look, take a look at this map here and think about which is your basin. Um, I'm looking at my... And then I know I heard folks from Illinois and New Hampshire and, and Pennsylvania um, signing in. And um, you should take a look at where you are at, look, look on a map and see where you are, you are, where you are located um, relative to the nearest water body. Um, folks from Illinois are probably in the Great Lakes Basin somewhere. Um, New Hampshire was uh, referred to me maybe in the Merrimack watershed. And I don't recall where, where um, that individual from Pennsylvania was located, but um, could, you could be in the in Chesapeake or the Great Lakes, um, Lake Erie or Lake Ontario watersheds. So one of the resources that the Basin Program puts together every few years is, is called our State of the Lake and eighth graders at the time. Um, from around the basin. They actually, we actually brought some of these uh, graphics that, were, that are in this report 
out to school districts in, in the area and ask the students to interpret them, the early drafts of the, of the graphics, and, and then that helped us um, frame the, what is now in the, the graphics that are now in the final version of this report. But the intent of the report is to um, push information out there to folks who are interested in learning more about the lake in the basin and um, help them understand some of the trends and some of the indicators that resource managers use to gauge and measure the health of the lake from a number of different aspects. Uh, we look at this. This is kind of this is what we call the pressure state response model. And then we do some sort of management response in the watershed or the basin to try and improve the state of the lake. Um, plant trees or install a. Um, uh, or, or, uh, install a um, rain garden or or other stormwater prevention measures, for example, to reduce runoff into the lake and, and reduce that pressure from human development, climate changes, and other other uh, influences on the lake to, to again to in, in complete the circle and improve the state or the condition of, of the water of Lake Champlain or the health of Lake Champlain. Hey, Eric, this is Ashley. We are having some trouble hearing you. Um, and so I think at this point, actually, um, Colleen is going to take over um, sharing through her connection. But if you could keep sharing the PowerPoint, that would be really helpful. Does that sound okay? Yeah, it does. I can do that. Okay, thanks, Eric. So can everyone hear me? Sure can. Thanks, Colleen. Great. Thanks, Colleen. Okay. So uh, let's see. For the state of the lake, we thought we'd venture into the, um, whoops, are you, are you, we're gonna do a poll. <laughs> okay. okay. Eric, we're still using your um, presentation for the share screen. Okay. Um, so sorry, everyone. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, let's see. So next up, we're gonna talk about some of the phosphorus issues facing Lake Champlain. So uh, phosphorus, uh, you know, you always hear about it out there as being like the evil thing we're all trying to reduce in the lake. But phosphorus, you should know, is really not a poison. Uh, it has a tremendous, it offers uh, the ability to transfer tremendous energy into the system. It's really important for the development of bones and teeth, not only in humans, but in farm animals and other animals around us. It represents about 1% of human body weight. We need about 700 milligrams a day as we grow as humans, but we can excrete up to 2,000 milligrams a day. That's important to remember as we move forward on the phosphorus issue, because you'll find that both humans and animal waste are a major source of phosphorus in Lake Champlain. Next slide, Eric. <laughs> so this is an example uh, when we're talking about how much phosphorus there is and why it's important. You can see in this farm field that, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, Eric, can you back up to the corn? Uh, so you can see in the farm field that the crops that have a lot of phosphorus added to it grow quite high, uh, but those that are deficient in phosphorus don't tend to rise as much. So you can see those uh, smaller plants down below. Now, when phosphorus is on the land, it helps produce corn. When phosphorus enters the Lake Champlain waterways, it helps produce algae. Next slide, Eric. Is the slide advance? Yes, advance, please. So phosphorus has the ability to help algae grow. It's a nutrient. So just as it helps human bodies grow, it helps the plants and the algae, including the algae in Lake Champlain grow. Uh, our concern is that Sometimes when there's so much phosphorus in the lake, it's not just the regular algae it's helping to grow, 
but it's the cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. And as you know from the news media the last couple of summers, we have to be very careful about where we swim in the lake to make sure that there is not a cyanobacteria uh, bloom present. Uh, the blooms often disappear pretty quickly, but phosphorus is one of the nutrients that actually drives uh, those blooms to get excessive. Next slide, please. So there are two ways that we actually measure algae in Lake Cham or measure phosphorus in Lake Champlain. One is the concentration. I like to think of the concentration as being uh, how we measure it coming down through the river system. It's in um, micrograms per liter. But most of the data that you see in the State of the Lake report actually talks about the load of phosphorus that reaches Lake Champlain. And there we measure it in metric tons per year. One metric ton is just over a regular ton, about uh, 2,200 pounds. And it, I, I've been told, and I haven't seen the science, but it's about the equivalent of the size of a black rhinoceros. Next slide, please. So the way science this measure this and the way it's reported out to the public is based on this series of charts that we include in the state of the lake report. So for example, can you see the dotted line just above the 20 going from the left to the right? Uh, that is the standard which the scientists have set that they believe the Missisquoi Bay uh, should have about 25 micrograms per liter in order for the bay to be really healthy. Anything above that line would create too much phosphorus in Lake Champlain. So judging from this chart, the blue means it's a good amount of phosphorus to have in Missisquoi Bay, but everything in the red above is exceeding the limit that's set by scientists. Our goal is to get that red to go back towards the blue line. Next slide, please. So this is the chart that drives me crazy when I'm trying to read it on my cell phone, but I want you to take a look at a couple of things. First of all, can you see the pink circle? That's the uh, total amount of the volume of the lake water. So if you look on the left-hand side and you go down to the third, um, the, the, yes, the third one, you can see that that is the majority of the lake's uh, surface water is held in the main lake. Now, most of the time we're talking about uh, the main lake is being of good water quality. And you can see on the chart uh, just above that blue, uh, the, the third red, um, I'm sorry, the third pink dot, um, that the majority of that chart appears in blue. So that's good news. That means the phosphorus levels are pretty darn close to where they need to be. Uh, so if you want to, after this session is over, you should feel free to take a look at the state of the lake. Hmm, we're breaking up on this too, I see. So uh, if you look over on the right-hand column, that's where you will see Missisquoi Bay on the top and St. Albans Bay just below it. And you can see the amount of red in those sections uh, compared to the rest of the lake are quite high. So the phosphorus level is quite high. Next slide, please. Port Henry, on the other hand, on the New York shoreline, you can see is actually meeting that horizontal line requirement. There's very little red appearing above the blue area of the lake. Um, and Port Henry has about 5.7% of the water in Lake Champlain. Next slide, please. Okay, Eric. Yeah, did it, I advanced, did it not go? Yeah. Right. So most of the phosphorus that comes through Lake Champlain comes through the tributaries first. And in fact, if you're ever wondering how much rain falls on the lake, uh, you can think of it as 90% uh, of the water comes through the watershed first. 
only 10% of Lake Champlain's water uh, falls directly into the lake, either as snow or rain melt. Um, and I think for those of you who are in the Champlain Basin, you know that some of our tributaries will have very high spring floods, but at other times of the year, the major thunderstorms might be over in the Osable River, but the Missisquoi River might be dry that day. So as thunderstorms move around the Lake Champlain watershed, the volume of water changes as the tributaries dump that water into Lake Champlain. And as you can see, I think from this chart that the volume of water coming through a watershed or river watershed is associated pretty closely with the amount of phosphorus. So if you take a look at this chart, you can see the blue on the top. Um, that is actually the um, a volume of water that is coming through uh, the watershed over time for a particular river. And on the bottom, the green is the amount of phosphorus that's coming down that same river. So you can see that when the volume of water increases with a rainstorm, the volume of phosphorus also increases. And you can see far to the left, that very large spike, uh, or far to the right rather, where both the river and the phosphorus go right to the top of the chart. Uh, that was due to, to a very large storm event. Next slide, please. So sometimes it's hard to think about phosphorus and we're through ma the major graphics right now so we can lighten it up a little. Uh, there are things that we can all do on our homes and in our yards. So one of those is simply to raise the blade on your lawnmower up to th three inches. Um, that helps, uh, sorry, the phone's going off. Uh, that actually helps uh, let the grass grow higher. And if you let your clippings lie, it lets that um, organic matter build up in the soil. And the soil uh, on taller grass acts more like a sponge. And when it rains, uh, that sponge collects the storm water and rainwater and it holds it and it lets it go back out into the environment very slowly. Versus if that were a very short amount of grass, one inch, uh, then it, you'd have more likelihood that the rainwater would run off quickly and head down the street. So um, the slides on the right are really about the setup on your land itself. So the one above, you can see the yellow house, you can see the storm water um, coming right off the roof, coming right down the driveway into the storm drain. And of course, it would head down to a nearby river or possibly directly to Lake Champlain. But if you take a look at the chart on the bottom with the yellow house, you can see that a couple of things have been done. The people have added a rain barrel at the side of the house uh, to collect that rainwater. Uh, they redirected it through the downspout and the gutter system so that it goes onto the lawn instead of down the road to the lake. And they've also installed a small rain garden. And many of you students have been working on rain gardens in your respective schools. So thank you for that. And again, the goal of this um, procedure on your home and your yard is really to reduce uh, the amount of water that's heading downstream quickly so the pollution can settle out before it finds a nearby river. Next slide, please. Next slide, Eric. Okay, so here are a couple of close-ups. You can see the downspout. Uh, that would be the one on the left. It's collected all the roof runoff and it's collected the gutter water and that green portion is redirecting it uh, from a, a driveway into uh, the yard behind the people on the right-hand side. You can see it coming down off the building, off the brick, thank you, and into the rain garden, uh, which they're standing behind. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so sometimes, even with the best intentions, Mother Nature has oh, her own path. So here you can see a farm field 
This was during Tropical Storm Irene in 2011. It was a farm field from Isle of Mott, Vermont. We do not have any direct rivers running off the Champlain Islands into Lake Champlain. But this is a farmer's field and you can see the road, a little bit of grass, followed by the ditch, followed by what appears to be a very nice green buffer. Um, that buffer, unfortunately, due to the volume of water that is running off the farm field, uh, is actually being overflowed by that rain event. So the best intentions um, in this case for the farmer really didn't quite work out as planned. And I'm quite sure that this farmer went back after this rainstorm occurred and probably regraded the edge of his field or grew that buffer higher so that his soil and the nutrients on that soil did not get washed into that um, gutter the next time for a big storm came through. Next slide. So you'll hear in the news quite a bit, no matter what part of the country you're from, so this includes Pennsylvania and New Hampshire as well, that wastewater treatment plants sometimes overflow either due to a mechanical failure or a break in the pipes and send wastewater to Lake Champlain or a nearby waterway to you. The good news is that doesn't happen most of the time. And in fact, wastewater treatments are doing the job that they're required to do on probably 95% of the days. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side of this chart that the volume of phosphorus coming from wastewater back in the 1990s was very high. But over time, as regulations increased and as technology improved, those amounts of phosphorus declined significantly. So if you look all the way over onto the right-hand side, uh, you can see uh, that we are meeting the phosphorus requirements uh, for each state. And in fact, we're below the permit levels for each state. Uh, so Vermont in the green contributes the most phosphorus from wastewater. Red is for New York. And Quebec is very minimal because they have 7% of our watershed, as Eric said, uh, but uh, release very little back into Lake Champlain. So, so far we've talked about things you can do on your, on your home or lawn, what some of the treatments that the farmers use, including buffers do, and now we're looking at phosphorus from wastewater treatment plants. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the things that you can personally do at home to help wastewater treatment plants stay functional, especially in this type of setting where we're all doing extra cleaning and we're using wipes, please do not put those wipes in the pipes. Flushable wipes may fit down your toilet, but they're clogging up the wastewater treatment plant. So let's see. Um, actually, I can't hear things, so why don't you take this poll question? Great, all right, so my favorite part, I'm gonna launch this poll. So this is poll number two. This is asking about what practices you have that you could do on your property or at home to reduce stormwater runoff. So if you don't see this poll popping up on your window, that's okay, go ahead and put your answer right in the chat box. And we can um, see, it looks like we've got some folks are voting right now, lots of good options. Nice, I'll give it just probably 25, 30 more seconds here for folks to select a choice that fits for them. Nice, I love that some people are saying they would do multiple of these things.
Evelyn, you asked a great question in the webinar chat box. If you'd be willing to post that in the question and then answer section, we'll answer that at the end, because I think that's a great question that we should come back to. All right, I'm sharing out our results here. So Colleen, can you see those? Uh, yes. So lots of people are interested in scooping the poop and disposing of it. People are interested in raise the blade. Awesome. Yeah, these are all great options. Well, thanks everyone. It looks like you're doing a great job. Plenty more work to do. Okay, let's move rapidly along to our aquatic invasive species session. Uh, let's see how, how much we know about aquatic invasives and where they're coming from and what we can do to help. Okay, so a quick poll, Ashley. Here we go, launching now. We've got our third poll, what is an invasive? Launching this poll now. Again, friendly reminder, if this pop-up doesn't show up, go ahead and put your answer right into the, into the chat box. You can see the question on the, on, the, on the slide right now, on the screen share. So what is an invasive species? This is a tricky one. Answers are rolling in. All right. So it looks like people answered B, C, and D. Colleen, would you agree? I would agree. Nice job, everyone. So we used to think that aquatic invasive species just meant they were not native to the region. But in fact, they also either have to harm the ecosystem or the economy or they're a threat to public health. Uh, so that's what the scientists used to gauge um, aquatic invasive species versus just a non-native species. So thank you for that. Okay, let's go on to uh, the next slide. So this is a little chat box question, Ashley, do you wanna talk about? Yep, so launching this poll here. So looking at this, how do you think that these aquatic invasive, these aquatic invasive species get into Lake Champlain? How do they get here? We'll give you a, another um, few seconds to talk about that, and then we'll get right into the answers with some slides. Okay. All right. There we go. There are some good answers. Uh, in actual, actually, you're all right. They are carried in on recreational boats. They do enter the system when we dump aquariums into lakes and rivers, and they do move through the canals. Um, you can also have them uh, be carried in in bait buckets, and that's why New York, Vermont, and Quebec have bait legislation in place. So you never dump your live bait back into the lake, you dump it back onto the land. Um, the slide that Eric has pulled up now really takes a look at the aquatic non-native species and the invasive species that have come into the region. Uh, since 1883. Some of this work was uh, compiled by Dr. Ellen Marston from the University of Vermont and several other people have also added uh, data into the system. So you can see that um, the invasive species are the ones in green and the blue are the non-native aquatic species. So some of the ones that might surprise you uh, would be the largemouth bass is a non-native the rainbow trout, the brown trout, and uh, the, whoops, what is that? The woodland pond snail. I've never seen one of those. 
On the other hand, the invasive species are ones you might be a little more familiar with because they're in the news a lot more. Purple loosestrife, the water chestnut plant, the water chestnuts are the ones that have a little air pocket, that's what I call it in technical terms, yep, uh, in the plant itself so that they float on top of the water. Uh, then you have Eurasian water milfoil, which lives under the surface. And uh, some of you may not recognize the scientific name, but you might think of it as seaweed that wraps around your legs once in a while. If you're swimming, there's the zebra mussel, which were first found by a 13-year-old from Orwell, Vermont, in Lake Champlain. The alewife, uh, which you hear of, it's the species that will sometimes boom and bust, for example, it's a small fish, but if the weather is just right and the surface temperature pops up or down three or four degrees, you can have a die off. And then the, one of the newest invaders is a spiny water flea. Um, now, not all non-native species wreak havoc on the lake, but the invasive species can be very problematic. Okay, next slide, please. So, why are they getting here from the Great Lakes? Well, look at how our systems are connected. Lake Champlain is over on the right-hand side. We're tall and thin, very model-like, very good. We connect south uh, through the Champlain Canal, out to the Erie Canal, which takes us out to Lake Ontario. Uh, and then Lake Ontario, of course, is connected to all of the Great Lakes. And eventually that water flows uh, from Lake Ontario back up the St. Lawrence River, which we connect uh, at the Richelieu River uh, in Quebec, our Richelieu River. So water flows from Lake Champlain into the Richelieu and out the St. Lawrence. So we have a direct connection to the St. Lawrence as well, a very large area. Uh, you can see that Champlain has 51 species, but look at the Great Lakes, 187. Here's a picture of the New York State Canal, uh, and that is one of the ways that species can come in. We're okay, you can go back to canal, there you go. Um, it is, it's very cyclic in lakes. Um, we, we take species that come in from other places and we hope we're not sending ours elsewhere. Let's move on to that next slide. Ah, this is one of our coworkers, Meg's favorite slides. So look, I'm gonna give you just a second to um, orient yourself. You see Lake Ontario out there on the left. Lake Champlain has the teal title, yep, and we're long and thin. But look at the key that's down here on the left-hand side. The green area, areas show where the boats came from prior to visiting Lake Champlain. So you've got some coming off of Long Island Sound, uh, some out of the Great Lakes. Um, but if you take a look at the pink areas, uh, look where Lake Champlain is sending boats. The boats will go to the St. Lawrence. They'll go back out to Lake Ontario. Uh, they go back down towards the canal system. And then the blue ones, the light, that medium blue, that's the prior to and next visited. So in other words, some boats go back and forth perhaps between the Connecticut River and Lake Champlain, largely, probably anglers, um, or sometimes boaters, uh, Lake George and Lake Champlain as well. Uh, and then uh, Lake Champlain and the uh, sort of Champlain Canal going down to the Hudson River as well. So there are many vectors, that's what we would call these, the travel patterns for how invasive species get here. And this particular slide deals only with the boats. The boat launch stewards are one of the ways that we both here in Lake Champlain and in the Adirondacks and all over the country for that matter, are trying to restrict the movement of invasive species that are carried by boats. Over 11 seasons, we had 95,000 boats that were surveyed at the boat launch sites in Lake Champlain, both in New York and Vermont, and now up in Quebec as well. Over 200,000 boaters were surveyed, but I want you to zoom in over here um, on the right-hand side. 4,782 species were intercepted at those boat launches, which is incredible. And 89% of the boaters 
in the last few years have now said that they actually do take spread prevention um, uh, action. So what are they doing? They're cleaning, draining, and drying their boats. Some of these invasive species that are now shown on the screen are the ones that we're worried about coming on in. So we have, um, let's see, hydrilla. Uh, we've got the quagga mussel. Uh, and we have, uh, oh, two species I should know. Maybe, maybe Ashley knows. I think it's round goby on the right. Yep, round goby in the bottom right. And then is that starry stonewort on the yes, left? Yes, it is. Thank you very right, much. I couldn't very remember good. the name. Excellent. Okay, so those are the species we're worried are gonna come in from somewhere else. But in the meantime, we don't wanna send our species anywhere else either. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, and here's the big message. It doesn't matter if you're in a canoe or a kayak or a motorboat or you're bringing your sailboat down the Hudson, you need to clean, drain, and dry your boats. And an example of one of the largest boats that travels Lake Champlain that does just that is the Lois McClure from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. When that boat comes back from a trip down the St. Lawrence and it's coming in the north end of the lake, they send their divers to look underneath that boat and just scrape off anything that's on the bottom. They do not want to be the boat that brings some of these species in. At the same time, recreational boaters really need to do the same. So I'd like to end on a lighter note and talk about some of the swimming and fishing that's available in the plain and how we use the lake for recreation. After all, it's it's why we use the lake, or it should be the reason we want to help keep it clean and healthy. Um, many of you, I'm assuming, swim in Lake Champlain. I have a summer camp in Georgia, Vermont. I swim almost every day in the summer. I did not have an algae bloom until October 9th this year, so there was no reason for me not to be swimming in the lake. The blue circles on this map indicate that the beach over the beach, that particular beach over overall is in good condition. It's closed between zero and five days, and that was over a three-year period. Fair are some of the yellow beaches that are indicated, and poor are the red ones. Um, so fortunately, we don't have a lot of poor. We have one way down here in the South Lake, where the lake is much more river-like. Uh, and then we have a couple up on the northern end of the lake, and again, that would mean they're closed for, uh, for 20 days. Uh, Plattsburgh in that period had a few issues, but overall, most beaches are swimmable on most days. And as students, what's critical is that you pay attention to the local health advisories. And if you see that your beach is posted for cyanobacteria, please do not go in the water. Find another beach. Talk about fishing. Not all of us have the opportunity to get out on boats. Um, but to fish for some of the larger sport fish like salmon, um, but they are beautiful and they continue to grow. We continue to break records on Champlain. Some of us have fished from docks or the shoreline quite a bit in our lifetime though. We're often fishing for yellow perch or more recently, white perch. If you take a look at some of these, well, these four lake species that are identified, we wanted to put this chart up here to talk about the mercury concentration. Mercury is a toxic, it can harm human health, and the problem with it is that it bioaccumulates. So if a small macroinvertebrate is eaten by a yellow perch, that mercury continues to carry up the food chain to the smallmouth bass or to the lake trout or walleye. So in this case, walleye, uh, you see this yellow horizontal bar? That is the uh, amount or the criteria that's set by the US EPA for mercury levels. And we want to be staying below that yellow bar when we uh, consume a lot of fish. Um, but as you can see, can you see the 2011 numbers in here compared to the others? It's the uh, one, two, three, fourth column in. Most of the time, the 2011 numbers were significantly less, meaning we had done a good job in reducing the amount of mercury 
coming into Lake Champlain and in many other lakes in the northeastern United States. Much of that reduction, we believe, was because of the mercury reduction laws that were put in place at the national level. However, when the most recent data came out, you can see that the numbers in 2017 jumped back up. That's the last column in the right under every fish category. So um, lake trout, walleye, smallmouth bass all came back up. Fortunately, white perch and yellow perch are still uh, considerably below the yellow line. So scientists, not just in Champlain, but nationwide are trying to figure out why this increase occurred. So there'll be more on that in the next uh, State of the Lake report. I think we just have one or two more slides left. Thanks for hanging in here. Um, here is a chat box question. Ashley, you wanna take this? Yep, all right. So this actually is just a fun little question. We just wanna know what are some of the ways that you enjoy your favorite body of, or body of water? So it could be a lake, a pond, a river, a stream. Um, what do you do in that lake? What kind of recreational things do you like to do? And so we just want to hear about what fun things do you like to do when you're hanging out in the lake? I'm seeing a lot of swimming. Excellent. Nice. That's great. Kayaking. Okay. Very good. Um, so we'd like to do um, a couple of things, and I'm going to let Ashley take this, but we wanted to show you just a couple of slides to remind you how important our local waterways are to us. So hopefully by this summer, we're back out there enjoying them. There are all sorts of river and watershed groups that you can join to help protect local waterways, but also to get out and recreate, uh, to paddle and to swim uh, with people from these different areas is an awesome way to spend some summertime. This group of canoers are having a canoeists, I guess, kayakers too, having a great time. And I think our last line, maybe, coming up. Eric, you wanna switch that slide? <laughs> what <laughs> would be our swimming opportunities in Lake Champlain. Um, so we have a lot of choices to make, and I encourage you, students to think about why these rivers and lakes are very important to you personally and to your family and to your community and think about ways that you can help uh, these water bodies benefit in the long run. You are the stewards of this lake and this region now and we need everybody to do their part uh, to make a stronger environment and our waters healthier all the time. Uh, there is one thought that I'd like to leave with you before we do a quick Q&A, and that is um, we, we would challenge you to do something at this time where many of us are working from our homes. We wanted to give you a little watershed activity. So if you could think about mapping, creating a map of your property or your apartment complex, and then the next time it rains pretty heavily, Go outside after the rainstorm and add arrows to your map. See if you can figure out where that rainwater is coming from your property and where it's going to. And then maybe you'll be able to propose some solutions like we talked about with rain gardens, rain barrels uh, as well. So um, you can think about that as an activity. It's sort of fun. We do it with teachers. Um, I've done it with uh, my family as well. And it helps to uh, provide some solutions to what you can do at home on your own landscape. All right. We have some additional resources that are available online. Uh, we'd like to thank Sea Grant for having the Lake Champlain Basin Program participate today. And I would encourage both students and teachers and the public uh, to take a look at these resources for more information. Ashley, do you want to talk about Q&A? Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, uh, we only have, it's 101. I know we got, we had a couple of technological glitches. And so I'll just pose, there's one question that's kind of come up and there's been some follow-up questions on it. I think this would be a, a good question to answer live. So someone asked about, 
someone was asking about the 2011 um, year based on that chart that you were showing with the yep. fifth levels of mercury. And so one question was just asking about 2011 was a year with more water. Um, and so I had responded and just said, yep, 2011, so we had severe spring flooding, and then we also had Hurricane Irene later in the year. And then two follow-up questions on those were asking about, did mercury levels in 2011 go down as a result of Hurricane Irene and the extra water? And then another panelist also asked if maybe there was some relation to mercury based on dilution. And so I'm curious uh, if anyone from the Basin Program wants to jump in and, and answer that. Yeah, I wonder, that's a pretty technical question, and it's my understanding that it may not have been dilution, but I'm wondering if we can try to let Eric back in on audio. Sure, um, I, can, I can give it a shot. Um, so that, okay. Eric, if you stop sharing your screen, it might give your <clears throat> server a little better bandwidth. Sure. All right. Hopefully that'll help. Um, so th the quick answer is no, it is not because of dilution. Um, the mercury bioaccumulates in the fish and th therefore, because it, it would have been building up over time, um, the fish would not have re responded, the fish uh, tissue would not have responded that quickly to the, if we are measuring concentration of the water rather than the, the amount of mercury in the fish tissue, then that might have been different due to the, due to the flooding, but these were results were due to, or, or we're looking at regulations that had been set in place for several years prior to that to reduce air emissions of mercury. Um, from the coal plants in the Midwest in particular. Um, and then, <clears throat> and so that, that was kind of the, the running theory at that point in time. And then we received results from the 2000, uh, the most recent assessment in 2016, I think it was. And uh, they went back up again. And that actually could have been due, due to a, a higher uh, loading or influx of mercury from the floods that brought or delivered more mercury from the watershed in 2011 and then in two, by 2016 that mercury had accumulated great thank you so much eric um and, and that answer did come through mostly so that's awesome um the last thing that we want to do um we'll put a link for the lake champlain basin resources in the chat box we'll also put a link to the lake champlain basin um, general email so if you have questions or want to follow up on anything else um and caroline if you want to share um our last couple slides i'm going to launch a poll here this is just asking there's a series of questions um it's just asking about your experience here um, and so just rating the Zoom at Scientist experience you had today, hearing from our presenters and um, learning from us today. So make sure you check these. Uh, we get some poll answers here before you dip out. And then Caroline's gonna put some information up. She's gonna share her screen here. Um, and we just wanna share with you that our next webinar is gonna be this Friday. The topic this Friday will kind of build on some of the information that you learned about today. And so it will dive into some of the monitoring and some of the, a little bit of the science behind monitoring lakes and streams um, and how that contributes to watershed science health. And then we'll offer a few more tips and tricks on ways to be a great watershed steward. Um, awesome, I'm gonna end this poll and launch another one. Yeah, go ahead and put your answer in the chat box. Um, and let's launch our second poll. So now we want to know, I want to know, what do you think you learned today? So did you learn a ton? That would be excellent, number five, or um, not very much because you're already an expert. That would be number one. If you can't see the poll, go ahead and put your response into the, we can capture it in the chat box here um, as well. You will be able to, Nate's putting the links in right now to our virtual learning series. You'll be able to register on the web um, and it'll be a similar setup to today's session in terms of using Zoom and all that good stuff. Awesome.
Awesome. Great, and then I'm gonna launch our um, next poll. And so this one, I'm curious to know if you feel like after this session today and everything you learned, did you learn things that you would feel confident sharing with your friends and family about water quality? Some of these tips and tricks, some of the pieces that we talked about, um, would you be able to share and explain this to someone else? Um, so just curious about, about that. And then thanks, Nate just threw the chat box link in there so you can follow up and see all the awesome resources. I will say the graphics, some of you commented on how awesome the graphics were. Those are all available on the Lake Champlain Basin website. Um, and so you can see them kind of, you can click through some of those different graphics. They're really awesome. And I think that they make it really easy to understand a lot of the awesome research and science that's happening here on Lake Champlain. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We had an awesome time and thanks so much for being patient with the technology. This is our new normal, but we were so glad to connect with all of you and we hope to see you all on Friday. And it looks like Eric just popped into the chat box, um, the State of the Lake report that you can look at online. Thank you all so much. Have a great day and we will we'll talk soon, hopefully. Yep, this, uh, this meeting's being recorded and we'll put it up on our website too for those of you that maybe don't get a chance to, to watch it right now, you'll be able to watch it afterwards. Thanks everyone for joining us. Really fun having everyone on the line. Thanks to the Basin Program for leading today's presentation. Really appreciate it. Thanks everyone, goodbye. Ashley, have we paused recording or not yet? Um, not yet, but I can definitely do that. Nice job guys. Sorry that didn't work out well for me, but I think Colleen did okay. <laughs> Colleen, great. Yeah, Colleen did great. I'm oh. sorry, I couldn't hear the volume, it finally.